When the French tank tree dropped in La Resistance back in December 2017, the top tank was the AMX 30 B2, which was a step back from the top tanks of each nation back then when they were already equipped with stabilizers. Japan had the Type 74, Germany the Leopard A1A1, US the M60A1, USSR the T55 and T62, Britain the Chieftain, Conqueror, and Centurion families. France, however, had a glaring weakness. None of their tanks had gun stabilization. From the AMX 30s to the AMX 13s, they all had floppy gun syndrome at BRs, where tanks were mostly stabilized. It wouldn't be until Project X that France would have its first stabilized tank, the AMX 40, and its second and third, the AMX 30 Super, and the Leclerc in update Imperial Navy. But then we started having more tanks like the AMX 10 RC and the Brenu, also without stabilization but with thermals and laser range finders. So, what gives? Why exactly do the AMX 30s not have stabilization, even though the AMX 30 B2 went into service as late as 1982? Today, we're going to take a look at the culprit, the Kotak fire control system, and we're also going to take a look at the doctrine that led to these design choices. The Kotak fire control system stands for these words on the screen that I won't read because it's French. The Kotak fire control system was installed in the AMX 30 B2 series of tanks as well as the AMX 10 RC. The original AMX 30B, known as the AMX 30 1972, and the premium variant at 7.7 were not fitted with the Kotak fire control system as they were only fitted with the M208 coincidence range finder. In due, thanks to the federal agency whose name evokes recollections of fabricating vampire attacks in the Philippines to scare communists or playing haunted mixtapes in Vietnam to scare the Viet Cong, we are provided with a more or less detailed description of how the Kotak fire control system works. The Kotak, or the Kotak M581 gun sight, is made up of five components. The M5A4 coaxial telescope, the M550 laser rangefinder, M579 electric controller, M421 angle computer, and a two-axis gyroscope. The angle computer generates an electronically driven aiming reticle. The electronics receive input from the laser rangefinder or manual input from the commander, from which the aiming reticle will drive itself to the point where the gun is to be aimed. The gunner is then free to move the gun to that position to get an accurate shot. Think of it like an arcade battle's aiming reticle. Once the angle computer receives an input from the laser rangefinder, it shows you on your sight where to aim your gun and fire. However, don't let the two-axis gyroscope throw you off. That's not for the gun or the sight. That's for the laser rangefinder to track moving targets and provide traverse and elevation data to the gunner. The gun drive of the AMX 30B2 is the CH27S electrohydraulic system that works with the fire control system to present a ballistic solution for the gunner. This does not stabilize the sight or the gun. If that was too complicated for you, let me provide a demonstration on a moving target. Of course, War Thunder has a different way of making laser rangefinders work, automatically adjusting elevation for you once the laser rangefinder acquires range. So, we'll just simulate how Kotak works. Once the target has been marked by the laser rangefinder, the ballistic computer will point to where the gunner should aim the gun. Because War Thunder automatically adjusts rangefinders for elevation for all vehicles equipped with it, it is not reflective of Kotak's functions, but is an overall better option gameplay-wise. And like in War Thunder, the fire control system also takes into account the type of shell being used to account for the differences in muzzle velocity. It's also important to note that while the Kotak provides an almost advanced level of ballistic computation for the gunner, this still does not allow the tank to fire on the move. This document notes that the AMX-30, using the CH-27S electrohydraulic drive, does not stabilize the gun. The AMX-30B2 uses the same CH-27S, and it follows that the AMX-30B2 cannot fire on the move as well. An improvement on the Kotak fire control system, known as the Kostak, or once again the words you see on the screen. Kostak adds gun sight and gun stabilization and would be first implemented on the AMX-40. Okay, full stop. I know you're probably already saying, but the AMX-32 was stabilized, and you're already citing the M527 gyroscopically stabilized panoramic commander sight paired with the SFIM Minerva torque converter gearbox and 
about commander inputs to the site. Well, first of all, congratulations on checking the War Thunder wiki. But, I would hate to burst your bubble. I don't think that's how the AMX-32 works. The same document that explained how the Kotak fire control system worked, and remember, the technologies incorporated on the AMX-30B2 were from the AMX-32. It explains that while the M527 can continuously traverse and provide signals to the moving target, the Kotak FCS remains the same, providing azimuth data to the gunner, and the gunner has to manually aim the gun itself. And it's worth noting at the end that the document does state that the AMX-32 probably needs to stop to fire the gun. The gun uses the ATS GS-32 electrohydraulic gun drive. The gun drive has gyro tachometers for elevation and traverse, but there's nothing to suggest that they are stabilizer references. They're most likely references for the Kotak fire control system and don't actually stabilize the gun. Because the tank had such a short lifespan, it only ever amounted to six prototypes, we don't really have an extensive assessment of the AMX-32 to draw any definitive conclusions. I have this data from the CIA that says it probably has to stop the fire. Uh, data from Saturday 7, 9, and 10 that says fire on the move is only for emergencies and is not considered as a full-on feature. Now, we've answered how the AMX-30 cannot be stabilized, but we haven't answered the why. For that, we must dive into tank development influences in the Cold War. From that, we start with the NATO doctrine of forward defense. Strap in because this is going to be a Perun video from here on out. If you're wholly uninterested in Cold War doctrine and how it shaped tank development and are only interested in tank technologies with respect to the game, you are free to end the video at this point and I thank you for watching. But for those who are interested in going, strap in. Before we look at the French perspective on NATO doctrine, it's important to present the context in which these doctrines were made. So, we look at the brief history of NATO. In 1945, when Germany surrendered, the United States had 3 million soldiers in Europe, Great Britain had 1.3 million, and Canada 300,000. The Soviet Union had 4.5 million soldiers in Europe as well. Within a year, the American strength was greatly reduced to 391,000, the British down to 488,000, and the Canadians completely withdrew while the Soviets maintained the 4.5 million figure and their wartime production remained. The Soviets also annexed massive amounts of European territory into the USSR and the rest were militarily occupied such as Poland and East Germany. This, on top of the mounting economic catastrophe in the Europe post-war before the Marshall Plan, it cemented the belief that a Western European alliance was necessary. The first step in this was the Brussels Treaty. It was relatively small compared to what NATO would become today as the only signatories were United States, United Kingdom, France, and the Benelux countries, Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. The most interesting part of this treaty was the Article 4 provision which states that any attack among the contracting parties will be subject to military aid and assistance from all the other parties. You could call this the spiritual predecessor of NATO's Article 5. When the Vandenberg Resolution was signed in 1948, it saw the American involvement in collective defense in Europe which would become NATO a year later. Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe or SHAPE was established subsequently, and an integrated Allied Command was established as well. Fast forward to 1966. The French, the solution by the inaction of the United States in the French Indochina War, the Algerian War of Independence, and their opposition to the British and French position in the Suez Canal, moved to remove themselves from the Integrated Allied Command in Europe on February 21, 1966 through a press conference held by Charles de Gaulle. This included all French personnel being withdrawn from Allied Command by July 1 and the closure of shape and withdrawal of NATO military presence in French territory. De Gaulle continued, however, that the French are not withdrawing from NATO entirely. It will remain a member and fulfill its obligations outlined in the treaty whilst being independent of Allied Command. This effectively meant that NATO could no longer rely on the French military's participation in the defense of Europe should an invasion occur. In between the formation of NATO and the French withdrawal, something called the West German Rearmament occurred. 
In order to supplant NATO with more military divisions, the Allied Command decided to reactivate the Bundeswehr to participate in the Allied Command. With Germany requiring a low-cost but modern tank for the rearmament, France was poised to offer the AMX-13-105. A private company also offered the Char-25T or the Bat Chat, but neither of these would be adopted as the concept of a medium tank with a 105mm gun and 80mm frontal protection was considered. A working group called FinBel, which stood for France, Italy, Netherlands, Belgium, and Luxembourg, existed at the time which looked into replacing the American tanks each nation was using. At the time, the United States flooded these militaries with the M47 Patton medium tank. With the West German rearmament, the Germans joined the Finbel working group and it was renamed Finabel, with A standing for Allemagne or Germany in French. They drew a set of specifications, dubbed Finabel A3A5, which called for a tank limited to 30 tons to be armed with jointly developed Franco-German 105mm gun. The first setback for the project came when Charles de Gaulle came to power in 1958 and refused Germany and Italy nuclear technologies to develop a common tactical nuclear weapon among the three nations, leading Germany and Italy to lose interest in pursuing the working group. In 1963, Germany started opposing the project and they started to designate their own prototypes, with the French prototype receiving the designation AMX-30 and the German prototype receiving the designation Leopard. Germany opted not to use the Franco-German 105mm and ordered 1500 Royal Ordnance L7 guns from the British, leaving France to develop ammunition for their 105mm while they could not procure tanks until 1965, with the first deliveries arriving in 1966. So what actually was the idea behind the tank designs of the Leopard 1 and AMX-30? Let me present to you NATO's strategy of forward defense. The forward defense strategy is carried out by the three-tier tactic called the active defense. NATO outlined four avenues of attack in Central Europe. The Northern German Plain, the Göttingen Corridor, the Fulda Gap, and the Hof Corridor. Active defense begins the moment the border is breached by Warsaw Pact forces. The first tier of active defense is akin to delay and screening tactics wherein forward elements such as mechanized infantry and armor harass and ambush the leading elements of the invading force. This buys time for the defensive elements in the rear to prepare for the next tier of the defense known as defense and sector. It takes elements of positional defense in which obstacles, mines, and entrenched infantry hold off any remaining elements of the invading force. The difference between defense and sector and positional defense, however, relies on its flexibility of defensive lines. Positional defense is static, whilst defense in sector allows defensive lines to bend in order for commanders to determine which sectors are bearing the heaviest brunt of the invasion and can move to reinforce the area. Once a successful defense is mounted, the counterattack phase begins wherein the mobile defense tactic aims to grind the invading force to a halt while vulnerable flanks are exploited encircling the forward elements and cutting them off from supply and communication lines before the second wave arrives. This allows NATO forces to regain lost territory and restart the forward defense strategy. This strategy can be repeated over and over again until the attack is repelled. The strategy is also flexible. Each tier can be repeated over and over until objectives are met. I would go on about the relationship between NATO aircraft and ground forces interdiction, but that's no longer related to the AMX-30 development, so I would just proceed. This leads to the tank design. Because they employed defensive tactics instead of a mass assault through the Fulda, which the Warsaw Pact was expected to perform in case of a Cold War gun hot scenario, most NATO armies had forgotten the stabilized guns up until around the 1970s. Britain was a huge proponent of stabilized guns thanks to their experiences with the cruiser tanks in World War II. US also considered mounting a stabilizer into the M47 dubbed the M47E1 of which six were made. Germany also had the Erprobungsträger mit 3 Achstabilisiertem or commonly known by its War Thunder name the term 3 which was built on a Leopard 1 chassis in 1966. By the late 1960s and early 1970s, stabilizer technology has progressed to the point that tanks that need not be built with a stabilizer 
and could mount stabilizer packs such as the next three Leopard 1 batches dubbed the 1A1 that included stabilization from Cadillac gauge. The M60A1 AOS followed suit in 1972, opting the same course as the Leopard 1A1 and inducing an add-on stabilization pack. However, the AMX-30 sat the 70s out without a stabilizer and the B2 upgrade did not include a stabilizer but instead opting for the Kotak fire control system. While France experimented with a stabilized tank in the form of the AMX-40, it was not shown interest by the French army who were already working on the Leclerc at the time. The Leclerc would be as radical a change in tank design as the Leopard 2 was in comparison to the Leopard 1. France would whittle down the crew to three by incorporating a bustle autoloader, thermal cameras, and a new 120mm gun. The Gulf War in 1991 proved the obsolescence of the AMX 30B2 under the French army and the AMX 30SA under Saudi Arabia, with France avoiding direct confrontation against T 72s and leaving them to be confronted by the Abrams and the Challenger tanks from Americans and the British. By the end of the Gulf War, AMX 30s were finally phased out of service, and in the next NATO intervention, such as in Kosovo and UN peacekeeping operations in Lebanon, the Claire tanks were deployed. The last breath of the AMX-30 was the Brennus. It was an upgrade in the mid-90s but did not have to bring anything new except for ERA blocks and the IRL Infrared Dazzler, similar to the T-90A Stora. These were issued to peacetime rapid reaction forces but never saw combat until enough Leclerc tanks were produced to arm the rapid reaction regiments. In the late 80s, a joint effort among German companies to upgrade the AMX 30B2 included a gun stabilizer, a new engine, transmission, and fire control system. A single prototype was unveiled in Saudi Arabia, but there were no buyers. This was called the Super AMX 30. There were also talks of the AMX 30C2 upgrade in the 1990s that included a thermal sight and, catch this, another gyroscopic stabilized gun sight and turret. But this time, it says it has fire-on-the-move capability and not emergency fire-on-the-move capability, so we can probably finally safely assume that the stabilizer plus this is well after the AMX-40, so it makes more sense that it finally has gun stabilization. The AMX-30's developmental history and the context around its conception probably lends credence to its reputation as a definitive Europanzer. Along with the Leopard 1, they represent the best conventional warfare doctrine of Western Europe in the Cold War and the NATO philosophy in its nascency. There are a lot of more interesting features about the AMX-30 that are unrelated but are categorically French in nature. There's the lack of a bore evacuator instead of opting for a pneumatic fume extractor, a 20mm coaxial cannon, the towering commander's cupola, and the turret ammo storage for a tank that was a product of its time. Don't get me wrong, the AMX-30 is a great tank, it carried the French through the Gulf War and did it well. But there was no telling how it would fare in Central Europe in the late 70s and 80s if the Cold War popped off. The US employed the M1 Abrams, the Germans the Leopard 2, the British the Challenger. France and Italy would have faced T-72s and T-80s with their AMX-30s and Leopard 1s. If the AMX 30 B2s in Saudi Arabia were already reluctant to face Iraqi T 72Ms, what more T 72Bs and T 80s? Thankfully, we will never know, and while France has the Leclerc now, the AMX 30 will still remain to be a symbol, the standard of the French army from most of the Cold War. If you made it to this point, congratulations and thanks. I've been reading up so much source material on NATO doctrine recently for reasons completely unrelated to the present events. Maybe. The source material gave me a breadth of information pertaining to how NATO operated when the Cold War was at its most tense and how it eventually evolved into the NATO we see today. I don't know, I feel like this should be on a separate channel that covers history more than the game? Maybe? I don't know. But when it comes to historical development and whatnot, I've got a lot more videos and they're mostly detached from War Thunders. I'll probably think about it before I do anything. But then again, thank you so much for watching. This is the Dr. MD. And I hope you maintain a three-tiered strategy of liking, commenting, and subscribing. See you around.